Any more questions and we'll move on in that case. Okay, so uh, I'm going to now hand over to uh, Nick, who's the project manager, who's helping sort of coordinate all of this based in Queen's University. And Nick's going to talk to you about how to apply and some of the logistical issues uh, related to being, you know, being appointed as a early stage researcher. Okay, thank you. So first things first to say that we've received funding from the EU uh, for every single researcher and the, research, the, the researcher is paid at the same base rate, no matter where you are. So you have the A1 living allowance, which is 3,270 euro per month, and that will be corrected by an index to indicate the cost of living in each country. So we haven't indicated whether that will change depending on the country you're appointed at the moment, and that will be discussed more when you go to interview. On top of that, because it's recognized that you're changing countries to go and work and live, they also pay you a mobility allowance of 600 euro a month. And if you have a family, which is a, um, a, a spouse or somebody who you are looking after, there's also a family allowance payable on the top. Those rates are fixed. Uh, the mobility allowance and the family allowance are fixed. And your status when you enter the project is what decides your family allowance. So you can't get married during the project and be paid the family allowance. Um, and so that said, um, oh, move over. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, to be an early stage researcher, you must fulfill a couple of rules. And the first rule is your career stage. Um, and so when you get your degree or your master's that allows you to go into a doctorate program, the clock will start and you will have to be enrolled as an ESR in Mistral before four years of full-time research experience have elapsed and you haven't been awarded a PhD. This is a PhD program, so you can't have another one before you come into it. And the example on the screen is that they want to differentiate between having taught classes and doing research and if you reach four years, you cannot be eligible as an early stage researcher. Uh, and as we spoke, spoke about earlier, there's also a mobility rule. You must not have lived in the country that you're going to work in in the last three years for more than 12 months. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. You can be from anywhere in the world to become an early stage researcher, but you must have spent less than 12 months in the last 36 months in the country that you are employed in. And so the example that's given there, you can be British and be employed by someone in the UK if you've spent more than 24 months out of the country in the last three years. Can I, can I just stop in because uh, Ehrlich raised a question on the chat box, which is, is it practically registration for PhD studies? So what Nick has just said maybe indicates it is. Uh, so it, we expecting everybody to register for a PhD and you're not applicable if you have one already. What is slightly different is the, the European Commission insists that actually you're offered an employment contract. So actually, unlike a student where you register as a student, this is actually having an employment contract while you're studying your PhD. Um, I forgot to say as well, um, clearly the, the language of the network is English, but you will be based in different countries. If you don't feel confident about raising a question in English today, uh, I unfortunately only speak English, but uh, Susanna can speak Portuguese, Spanish and French. So if you do want to ask a question in, in any of those languages, uh, we should be able to facilitate you during this webinar. Okay. Okay. Um, and I should say now, if you have any questions about your eligibility into career stage or your mobility, uh, the best way to uh, ask us about that is to email us through the project um, email address uh, and, and we can um, concentrate on you individually a little bit more. So um, how to apply? Uh, you can see the process that goes through through there and we'll go through each and every stage just to say at this point, that 
the best way to start this is to start on the Mistral website because all this information is there. And it also has information about how to apply for the DTU or University of Exeter positions, which is a separate process. Ooh, wrong way. So this is a screenshot. This is what you see when you go to the recruitment website. And there are two things that we'd like you to pay attention to. If you click on the ESR research projects, you will be able to find more about the projects Susanna and Grant have just described. Uh, it will tell you more about the supervisors, so you can contact them directly if you want to know more about the project. And it also has the job description that's the basis of what, how we'd like you to apply. Each job description has a series of essential and desirable qualities that we, would, uh, that we are looking for from the early stage researchers. And when you apply, you need to refer to those in your application. And so once you've had a look through all the projects and you've decided where you want to apply to, you can click on the ready to apply button and it will take you to this next page, which has all of this information in text. And at the bottom of the page is a link to go to the Queen's University Belfast Human Resources website, which will allow you to look at the advert which is the, the center advert for all the positions. Uh, and you can click on the apply online button to the bottom right, and it will take you to this screen. And you need to register. And what this will do will give us an information. It will give us an email address so that we can contact you about questions that we have, and we can tell you the result of what's happening or give you an update on what's happening in the selection process. And once you log in, that allows you to come back to it. So it's not something you have to do in one sitting. It will remember your information and it will take you to this summary page. And the idea of the summary page is to tell you how far you are through the application process. Uh, and to tell you now that all the buttons on the left of the screen there, they all have to be green before you can apply and submit your application. So to go through the, scre the, the screens that you'll have to, the pages that you'll have to fill in, the first page is your personal information. It gives you a contact name and address, uh, our phone number. And the second page is people who are willing to act as references for you and vouch for your experience and, and ability. The second page is the ESL projects. And when you go to this web, the page on the website, it will have a click box for all 15 projects. And what we're asking you to do is if you click on each project you would like to apply to. It only means you have to apply once. And what it also has, um, and so what we're asking you to do is if you want to apply to um, positions at DTU and Exeter, as well as other projects, we'd like you to apply here, as well as going out individually to the Technical University of Denmark site and the University of Exeter websites to apply for their positions. Um, and if you want more information on that, that's on the website. The reason is that was because we would like to try and pool candidates at the end that we'll talk about. This is the most important page. This is submitting your cover letter and your CV. Um, and the website only allows you to upload one file. So when you have your cover letter and your CV, you need to put them together into a single file, single PDF, and upload it to the website. And then there are three more pages. Um, because we're in Northern Ireland, we ask you to disclose your criminal convictions. It won't be used as part of the application. Um, page six is specific arrangements. If you have a disability or if you have a special arrangement you need for when you come to interview, that's the page to put the information on there. And the final page, the declaration page, is that you're, you have answered all the questions truthfully to the best of your knowledge. Um, because we have made a commitment to attracting uh, underrepresented groups into Mistral, we are going to ask you to uh, fill in some equal opportunity information. That information will only be used to audit the application process. It won't be used as part of your selection or for interview going further. And because, we, as we talked about, we would like to pool candidate, candidates in the event that we haven't filled an ESR position we may uh, share your information with the supervisor who needs a position filled, 
And for that reason, we need you to understand the privacy policy that's available. And it, all it really says is that we have a legal interest in sharing your information. We won't share it any further than the Mistral network itself. Uh, and after a while, and after a, a, a nominal period, when we fill all the positions, we will destroy the information, and so we won't be able to, um, we won't retain it. Um, and then you will come back to your summary page, um, and you will see all green ticks on the left-hand side. When that happens, the apply button will become live, and you can click and apply. And when you do that, you'll receive an email confirming receipt of your application uh, through the email address that you supplied to us when you registered. Um, and so what will happen after that, when the closing date comes on the 26th of February, uh, all the applications will be screened for the uh, career stage eligibility and the um, mobility eligibility. And everyone who doesn't seem to fulfill that eligibility, we will contact you and ask you to uh, clarify that. And only then will we, if we can't get any demonstration of eligibility, we will exclude you from shortlisting. But all eligible candidates will be forwarded to, to all the beneficiaries that you clicked on in the application process. Um, and then after that, the selection process will go to the beneficiaries themselves. They will have an, uh, a system which is open, efficient, transparent, and supportive. Uh, but it will be down to them to decide who to interview and who they want to hire. And they will contact you if they want to interview you. Um, there is a, a facility for a, you don't have to meet face to face. We will try and do video or phone interviews if it isn't possible to get you to the um, in, in, to get to the site. Um, and we think those are going to happen at the end of March, early April, possibly even earlier. We do have some beneficiaries who've indicated when they want to um, interview, and we'll put those up 